Welcome to Cage Minds Uncensored. Here in a little bit, we'll be playing my interview with half of the Bellator 194 co-main event. I got to talk with Derek Campos about his upcoming rematch with Patricky Pitbull Friday. But first, we'll talk about UFC 221. Took place in Perth, Australia. The fight pass prelims were a lot of fun. Definitely, if you have UFC Fight Pass and you didn't watch it, go back and check out the three fights. I thought they were very competitive and very entertaining. All had their elements of a brawl involved. But let's get to the Fight Pass prelims. Juicy Air Formiga versus Ben Wynn. Wynn did a very good job early of putting Formiga on the cage, attacking with strikes, before Formiga was able to judo toss Win, get him on his back, made the first round rough. Win came back great in the second round. In the third round, a spinning back fist out of nowhere leads to Formiga getting the back and putting Ben Win to sleep. Formiga, I think with this win, a guy that's been in the top five for a long time, this should set up a matchup with Henry Cejudo. Both guys have won two fights in a row. Got to be chasing Mighty Mouse. We don't know if it's DJ TJ or if we're or if the UFC wants to do Dillashaw Garbrandt too. So I think for Formiga, a matchup with Cejudo, so there's at least a backup number one contender at flyweight would be the best idea. Let's give Alexander Volkanovsky a top 25 matchup next time out in the featherweight division. Volkanovsky, a big ground and pound finish of Jeremy Kennedy, a relentless effort, and just saw that Zabit Magomedov is having problems finding an opponent. Volkanovsky looked quite mean. Maybe the two of them could get together, settle out, and see who gets into the top 15. Also on the fight, FS1 prelims, a performance that stood out. Israel Adesanya, the kickboxing veteran, did what he was supposed to do. He looked calm composed, showed a multitude of striking weapons, and was a assassin, was a sniper from the outside with his tools. We saw the low kick, we saw high kicks, we saw question mark kicks, you saw a lead hand, a back hand, you saw step in knees. Every weapon that a traditional kickboxer is able to use went on display. Adesanya fought brilliantly for the underhooks, was able to get back to his feet. Maybe a little more working on that grappling because the couple cage grabs, even though they weren't called by the ref, yes, I saw them. But all in all, very positive performance from Adesanya, who looks like he could make some noise in that 185-pound division especially with that ability to land the big shots. You move up to the pay-per-view, and back in the win column is Tyson Pedro. We saw his striking on display, landed some great shots, but Safarov did not want to get put down, was tenacious trying to get in on his takedown. Pedro able to go hard on a Kimura, gets the sweep, sold out for the submission, and gets a quick night of work finishing the fight in under four minutes. Now, in a much improved aspect of the night, I think Jake Matthews showed off the most improvements, the biggest improvements since the last time we saw him. Physically, looking a lot bigger. Uh, a guy that was a big 155er but didn't seem as big at 170, this fight even seemed to put on more muscle and size. And talking about going into this fight with Li Jing Ling, you would have thought that Jing Ling would have had a huge advantage in the striking, but it was Matthews being more accurate, teeing off on the chin, and scoring with the big strikes, then going back to his pad to takedowns and grinding out Jing Ling. A huge victory and a great improvement from Jake Matthews. Possibly on the verge of becoming a cult hero, now 2-0 and in the UFC. Another fun heavyweight in the image of Mark Hunt, Taya Tuivaso, from his boxing experience, definitely can throw them hands. Great overhands, getting inside on surreal Asgard, and putting the Frenchman on the cage, then doing devastation with the elbows over the top, getting the TKO victory in the first round in 2 minutes and 18 seconds. 
following the fight, chugging a beer out of a fan's shoe. That alone, as he said it, the shoey should have earned to Ivaso a hundred thousand or at least a fifty thousand dollar performance bonus. The man is on a highway to cult status there in Australia. A great dancer, a lovable fun attitude, antics like drinking a beer out of a shoe, and devastating striking. Tuivaso is definitely making noise there in Australia for his next fight. Names like Mark Gobier, who's won two in a row, could come up. A veteran test like that. Maybe a Justin Ledet, who, like Tuivaso, is 9-0. and See which prospect is on a higher rise. Or do we test the all-around game of Tuivaso and give him a more wrestling base? Justin Willis, who has hands. Who has hands. Tuivaso, though, I think a big matchup in his next fight with another top prospect. Somebody on a couple fight win streak would be what's in order. Talking about the heavyweight division, go on to the co-main event. Mark Hunt early teeing off on Curtis Blades, but Curtis Blades able to withstand the chicken dance, recompose, duck under, a big swing for Mark Hunt to get the takedowns, and from there on out, the wrestler would wrestle a dominant victory for Curtis Blades, controlling the second and the third round. Two judges actually scoring the first round, like I did, 10-10, because of the devastation of the hump punches versus the control time that Blades had. Blades in a smart fight. But I don't know if everything that Curtis Blades did is earning him enough in the climate of the UFC that we're in right now. Winning four out of five, and in my book, five straight, four Blades, the last two over Hunt and over a Alexi Alenik, getting these wins over veteran names. Blades is climbing up the ladder in the right way, but with unspectacular performances, with grinding guys out, you got to worry in a star craved MMA climate where Francis Ngannou was able to rise to the rates that he was able to off of big, spectacular knockouts. It wasn't just that Ngannou was on the cusp of becoming a UFC champion, but Ngannou was on the cusp of becoming a superstar. Curtis Blades has already said that he is in this for the money. A lot of guys would fight if if this was still not being paid for. If you were fighting for free, they would be fighting for free. Curtis Blades is not that guy, and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, because we understand a lot of people, the full intentions of doing this sport is to get paid, but not so many of them speak it, or not so many of them speak it while grinding out victories. Part of scoring those knockouts and having those silly fights is to get the fans, to get the fans to want to pay for you. People can understand and appreciate the grappling art forms and aspect of MMA. But that is almost a niche audience in comparison to the bloodthirsty fans and the people that like the knockouts. The people that love the blood, the guts, the violence. The people that love Conor McGregor because he talked a big game and then knocked guys out. It's not as easy to do that when you're a wrestler. Chow Sutton has found a way. But it's not as easy to be a wrestler who doesn't want to sell, who wants to be financially appreciated for what he's doing. It may be a hard path for Curtis Blades to walk, but with the credible win streak he's on, he's going to push that glass ceiling. He's going to push that theory. We'll see to the test, as now I think... Curtis Blades puts himself in position when you look at the heavyweight division, especially with UFC London being headlined by Alexander Volkov for BC over Doom, with JDS off dealing with USADA, with Francis Ngannou home for the first time, I believe, since he moved to Vegas, back home visiting his family. I think Curtis Blades has positioned himself as he asked for a turnaround here in Chicago at UFC 225, for a number one contender's bout with Cain Velasquez. Daniel Cormier, Cain Velasquez is number one, has speculated that Cain Velasquez would be returning this year. After 19 months away, 
I can't just see giving King Velasquez a heavyweight title shot, especially especially when looming is the DC Miocic fight coming up in July. But with the UFC needing marquee names, needing big matchups, with Velasquez intent to return, I believe a number one contender is about would definitely be in line for Velasquez. And with the streak that Blades has put together, he deserves to be in that fight. So I'm suggesting in Chicago, a Blades versus Velasquez number one contender bout is what we're going to see. Now, at UFC 221, you had the main event in the middleweight division. And somehow, you can't get away from the asterisks with Yoel Romero. Yoel Romero just happens to stay on the stool the 30 seconds too long. All the confusion in the Tim Kennedy fight. That victory gets that weird asterisk. You have Romero one, end up getting the USADA violation for taking a substance that had a tainted element in it. Another little weird asterisk. You have a Yoel Romero in the Jacare fight that Jacare's corner is complaining because the... Romero corner is just pouring water all over their fighter. Jacare complaining that that's making Romero too slippery. Then you have come the main event for UFC 221. Well, actually the weigh-ins. Where the short notice replacement, Yoel Romero, misses weight. Luke Rockhold still accepts this fight. It's an interim title fight after Robert Whitaker had to be saved from himself and pulled from the card. Missing weight, Romero can no longer win the interim title. Rockhold can. But the weird gray area is that winning the fight either way still then affords our Romero the ultimate opportunity. It makes him the number one contender and gives him that right, presumably, to fight Robert Whitaker. The first round, very slow paced, a lot of kicks back and forth. Rockhold working the low kicks. Romero kind of lulling, controlling when the actions are taking place. Checks a kick. You have some messed up movement from Romero. You have Rockhold with a busted open shin. Second round, Rockhold fades away from the leg kicking game. You have Romero a couple times explode in with some combinations, putting Rockhold against the fence. Rockhold not using great footwork, not using great movement, just circling the cage or going straight back to the cage. In the third round, eventually Romero explodes. A double jab followed by an overhand left. After the double jab, Rockhold tried to counter with a right hook, left himself exposed when Romero threw his left hook and Romero connects right to the Rockhold temple. Tumbling to the ground is Rockhold, a Romero uppercut finish, and your new number one contender, Yoel Romero. Do the asterisks taint the win? I'm not sure. It is a little weird when we think about weight cutting. What does it mean? What doesn't it mean? Obviously not harming Romero in this case, because even though financially I believe he gives up 20% for missing weight, he still gets the ultimate prize. He still gets the number one contendership. Michelle Pizarro's miss weight against Des Green got the win. It may just be short-term thinking, but so far, the dudes that have accepted fights against the guys that have missed weight have fared a lot worse in those fights than the guys that have just called off the fights and not accepted their opponent missing weight. Yoel Romero thought his leg was broke after the fight from the early damage in round one from Rockhold. Later reported by his manager, not true. Romero will just need some recovery time, just tissue mus muscle bruising and damage from the fight. Let's look forward to a summer bout for the middleweight title. Robert Whitaker, Yoel Romero too. And at the top of the middleweight division, you still got Kelvin Gastelum, Jacare Souza, and Chris Weidman. Who do they fight next? I think you have Jacare versus Weidman, and Gastelum is probably waiting to see what happens between Tiago Santos and 
David Branch, the winner then fighting Gastelum. From UFC 222, Tyson Pedro, again looking like a top prospect at 205. Jake Matthews settling very well into that welter division. Tai Tuivaso, I believe, on the path to becoming an Australian MMA cult heavyweight legend like his idol Mark Hunt. Curtis Blades got the biggest victory of his career, which I think will set up an even bigger fight. Almost an opportunity to get at that title. Yoel Romero on the positive side shines through on short notice. He's able to control exchanges, lull fighters to sleep, control distance, and is one of the best third-round finishers because he's able to temper his pace. Again, in a five-round long fight with Robert Whitaker, it's going to be an uphill climb. For Luke Rockhold, it's back to the drawing board, and it almost has to be worrisome once again that movement Defenses lap, defensive laps in where his hands are and falling in love too much with his boxing have been detrimental to Luke Rockhold. Be interesting to see what's next for the former Strike Force and UFC champion. Now let's get to that interview I mentioned earlier. Bella Torres, Derek Campos, how you doing, sir? I'm doing great, doing great. Way uh, point, quickly, hopefully. Everything is set to go, and I'm just I'm ready to go take care of business and put on a show. You and Patrique Freire, no strangers. This is a rematch from Bellator 117. Have you went and watched that fight over again? Yeah, yeah, I've watched that fight before uh, several times and just kind of looked at my mistakes, what mistakes I made, and and how I can fix those mistakes, and but. Here recently, yeah, no, I haven't watched it, but I watched it there for a time period and just tried to learn from my mistakes. So then I guess in preparation for this fight, have you, like, thought back then on the fight? Probably no need to watch it again? Yeah, I've, all I've done is just thought back on it and just how I don't, um, I don't want to lose. I don't want to lose to the tricky again like that and, and really just kind of feeding off of it, feeding, just trying to fuel the fire. Fueling that fire, and it's been burning great with a four-fight win streak. How have you been feeling over these last four? Uh, you know, I feel great. You know, each each fight, uh, each one of these last four fights that I've won, you know, I've been on, on point with my weight, you know, uh, been in physical, physically great condition, and each time, you know, my opponent was uh, bigger than me, so, I mean, I'm, I'm feeling really good. You know, I was always pretty much the underdog in some of those fights and and was able to come out on top just because of heart and, and grit and just push them through. So, I mean, that's, that's the same way I'm going to approach this fight. I'm going to grind it out and, and push through. Looking back since that last one with Pitbull, how different do you feel of a fighter from the guy that was at Bellator 117? Oh, I, you know, I, I, I feel... I feel completely different. You know, I've matured. I've, I've learned to fight smarter and more tactical and, and and just, you know, evaluate my opponent and see where his flaws are. You know, I'm just, I try to steer away from just being, you know, what people typically expect a brawler, you know, going there, stand toe-to-toe and bang. But, I mean, I can do that any given day because that's in my blood. That's, that's how I was bred to fight. But, I mean... For this one, it's, it's, it's going to be different, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in there and I'm going to implement my strategy that I've come up with with my coaches and just look to dominate Pitbull. Do you look at this fight as a number one contender, title eliminator situation? Absolutely, I look at this fight as a number one contender eliminator spot, um, because, I mean, they've got, you know, they've got Chandler and Primus doing the, the rematch for the title. So this, in my mind, is for sure the number one contender spot. And without a doubt, uh, I'm going to go in there and I, I refuse to be stopped. Has that thought almost put help you put in those extra rounds when you're tired and stuff, thinking this is the cusp of what you've been working for? Absolutely, absolutely. Every time I train... 
every day. Uh, I always push myself one more round, one more round of conditioning, because all I can think about is getting that chance to go and get that title, and that's that's my goal is just to win 155 pound gold and and, and to just leave a legacy to be proud of. You know, show put all of these years of hard work to have something to show for it. Now, having pushed your skills to a more technical as to a more technical aspect, at the time back in the day, did you realize how much of a brawler and a brawling mentality you had, or did you just look at it as going out there and fighting? Uh, really, I mean, back in the day, yeah, I, just, I would go in there and just rely on my toughness and my my, my ability to brawl with guys and, and wear them, grind them out, but you know. Yeah. Given the circumstances of how that first fight went, you know, I just, I got on, I was on the wrong end, I got caught, and uh, going into this one, it's just looking back on the way I, how I've come along and evolved as a fighter, you know, if I want to do this for a few more years, you know, I can't just keep brawling, I have to go in there and fight smart, and, and when the time comes to fight down on the mouthpiece and exchange, you know, I'll, I'll be able to do that, but there's no point in going in there and taking any unnecessary damage if I don't have to. You had been so used to the tendency of brawling. Was of brawling? Was there a learning curve of fighting that natural kind of instinct? Mm, there, no, I wouldn't say there was, there was a learning curve. It's just, I mean, you know, for me, over these past four fights, I, you know, that's been the time period where I've learned to turn it on and turn it off because, uh, you know. You've got natural born fighters, you know, who do know how to just have that killer instinct and just know how to turn, like, go for the kill in the cage. And then you've got guys that train themselves to be fighters. But deep down, you know, they don't really have that killer instinct. But for myself, like, I have that that killer instinct and that, that you know, when I see blood, when I, when I smell finish, you know, I can, I can go after it. But, you know, it's. These past four fights, I've learned how to just control it, turn it on and off, just know when to go, hit the go, you know. Looking at Pipple, looking at his recent footage, how much different of a fighter do you see than the one you fought? You know, this uh, these past few fights for Pipple, you know, I see, I see a different fighter, you know, I see a different Pipple, you know, he used to come out and... and and be real, you know, aggressive, and, and, and if, you know, if a guy wanted to start trading with him, you know, he'll, he'll trade with him and bang with him, but the pit bull that I've seen here recently over these past fights is a guy that's patient, a guy that's uh, picking, you know, his, his combinations, picking his angles, and then looking for the right shots, so that's the pit bull I see these days. So without a doubt, this fight is definitely taking the technical aspect to a next level on both sides. Absolutely. I think uh, he's going to come out with a strategy of his own. I'm going to come out with a strategy of my own. Somewhere in there, it's going to be a clash. It's going to be a brawl. But it's going to be, you know, like they say, it's going to be a beautiful mess. You know, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, you know, probably bloody, probably brutal. But there's going to be technique involved, and I think it's just going to be a bloody chess match. Talking about a bloody chess match, your last fight with Branding Gertz, definitely the best fight, I thought, of all of 2017 that took place in the Bellator cage. What was it like being a part of such an epic war? Uh, first of all, it was an honor, you know. Shout out to Brandon Gertz, uh, you know, I got a brother to me. Uh, it was just, it was just exciting, you know. I didn't, I expected to go over there, go in there, and, and, and be real tactical and, and break them down. But it just, it turned into a brawl, and you know, it was just, it was just two guys who had the will and the heart to, to not stop, and it, it just made for a great fight. And it's a fight that I'll never forget, a fight that I'll always take pride in. And yeah, it's just. It was just amazing. It was, it was amazing, and it was a better feeling having been able to put it on here close to my home backyard over at the Windstar. You know, it was awesome. In the moment, are you able to take in how special it was, or did it hit you after the fight? 
Oh, yeah, no, I, I took it all in at the moment, you know, because, I mean, even though they didn't let us finish the fight, me and Brandon both knew that we had uh, given it our all up until that point, and that's why at the end of the fight, you know, I grabbed his hand, I, put, I raised both our hands in the air because I felt like we were both, you know, that was, uh, that was uh, uh, kind of a bittersweet way to end, end, you know, the trilogy, you know. It's kind of like, kind of leaves the book open, but at the same time, it's, you got to have mutual respect for, you know, there's mutual respect for both of us. Starting your MMA career out, could you have uh, thought that you'd be in a war like that? Be a part of a trilogy like that? Uh, honestly, no, you know. I, uh, I never would have would have thought that I would have been a part of, like, you know, a trilogy like that. And to have been a part of something like that, it's just, it's a good feeling because, you know, a lot of people that, you know, come up to talk to me, that's one of the first things they bring up is that, that trilogy and they talk about that fight with Garrett and, you know, like I said, I, just, I take great pride in it and, you know, if ever a day comes again that they want, uh, you know, me and Gertz need to possibly run it back, then, you know, I would never, I would never say no to that fight because uh, Brandon is a game opponent and 100% class act. You've mentioned people coming up to you, talking to you. How do you handle that uh, fame aspect of uh, fame aspect of uh, being a mixed martial arts fighter in a big promotion? Um, really, you know, I just, I, I just keep a level head. You know, I, I, I stay humble. I don't forget, you know, where I've come from. You know, I'm, I come from a small town, you know, out here in West Texas, love Texas, and you know. We're pretty simple people out here, you know. It's, uh, it's just, I just, I just keep it simple, you know. People come up and tell me congratulations all the time and tell me how, you know, great of a fighter I am and how a good job I'm doing. And it, it, I take pride in it because, you know, the recognition that I get from folks around my hometown and from elsewhere, it just, it, it's great. It's rewarding and I just, I feed off that energy and to know that I have people behind me uh, when I'm in that cage, that, that's one of the driving forces that, that pushes me. And you train there in your hometown? Yes, yes. What are your thoughts? Some people feel like they have to move to a, a bigger camp to get different looks or whatnot, but you've stayed to your roots. What are your thoughts then on that kind of mentality? Honestly, you know, I, you know, I for a little bit, a little time, that a time period there, you know, I lived out in the Dallas area and I cross trained at a few different gyms out there. And then, you know, when I moved back home, I would still venture out to the Austin and Dallas area and cross train at a few different gyms. And just, you know, the knowledge that, and experience that I gained from cross training people in those big cities, you know, I, I, I've kept it with me and. I've tried to share it with the guys that I train with here in my hometown. And, you know, they pick up, they, they, there's several great fighters here. And pretty much, you know, they every, every, every guy that I train with here, they've got heart. They've got just sheer desire to learn and, and, to, and to just put in work. And, and that's what I need, you know. And, um, I just, I feed off that energy because it takes me back to when I first started and was looking to push forward and, and become something big in this, this fight game and, and become a champion. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of energy that I get here. And these guys put in hard, such hard work all the time. And, you know, I'm there with them, grinding it out. And that's, that's what I love. Bellator 194's Derek Compost. Derek, do you see this fight leading to a trilogy? Will we have another trilogy for you in store with Pitbull? That's hard to say. You know, I, I'm I'm looking to go in there and just completely completely dominate him. You know, I want this to be a completely one-sided fight, and and from there, my eye is on the goal. So I mean, it's honestly it's hard to say if there's gonna be a trilogy. If there is, so be it. But for now, my goal is to to completely dominate Pitbull and move towards the gold. Last thing, is there anybody that you needed to thank or shout out to? 
Yeah, pretty. Much, I mean, I just, I just, I'm, I'm thankful to all my training partners out here in Lubbock, Texas, uh, at, at Different Breed MMA and, and, and Big Head MMA, Eric Davila, Lewis Luna, uh, over at Different Breed, uh, Danny, Danny Perez, and Jonathan Martinez and his brother, and, and the rest of those guys out there at Different Breed, Joe Salcedo, Johnny Bice, you know. Uh, just all around good guys is out here pushing me. So, and then one last thing: what's the one thing you can't wait to eat when the fight's over? <laughs> you know, what I'm gonna say is uh, probably a nice, big, unhealthy stack of pancakes with you know, all the all the toppings that I want. <laughs> awesome, sir. Thank you for the time and best of luck. Thank you, Micah. Thank you. At the top of the Bellator 194 card is the continuation of the heavyweight Grand Prix, a rematch, Matt Mitrione, who is the heavyweight tournament favorite against Roy Nelson. Nelson has that knockout power, but the movement, the flow, Mitrione has seemed to take his game to another level recently. Roy Nelson, I gotta say you felt he took a step back. Maybe it was nerves, maybe it was something about making his Bellator debut, but not the strongest showing against Javi Ayala. That Nelson shows up, and I think Matt Mitrione is going to have a great amount of success. But it's hard to see this fight going quickly. And Matt Mitrione has done a lot of damage with damage being able to finish fights early because he has gotten hurt and got dropped. Even though he's been able to recover, he's gotten hurt and gotten dropped. If you get hurt and get hit by Roy Nelson, Big Country can put the lights out. It's an intriguing one. Patrick Friday, Derek Campos, again, the rematch. They were both young and much more wild. This is going to be a much more technical fight. Interested to see which guy can get the jab and push forward working. The Pitbull leg kicks could come into big play here in this one. Liam McGeary has kind of been on a slide for him compared to the domination that we saw early in his Bellator career. Vadim Nevkov, I think, will give him more of an opportunity to strike, but Nevkov does have that complete Sambo game. So a big fight for the Russian, a potential huge victory. They say they want to fight in the cage and in the ring. They're going to go out in the cage first. In the women's flyweight division, Heather Hardy and Anna Hulaton are going to do battle. Let's see some leather thrown in that one. On the prelims, a spectacular flying knee debut from Taiwan Claxton. What will he do in his second outing in the Bellator cage? So that's Bellator up in Connecticut on Friday night. Then also on Friday night, go over to Access TV, you got LFA. LFA 33 with a middleweight, or a welterweight, excuse me, 170-pound welterweight main event, undefeated fighters meeting identical 8-0 records. Kyle Stewart coming off of a TKO, thanks to knee injury, win over Jason Jackson at Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series. Man has three wins by knockout. Taking on Jaleel Wilkins, who has four wins by knockout. Also 8-0. In the co-main event at lightweight, Damon Jackson, the submission artist, takes on tough Texan Chris Vicero, who's going to want to try to keep this one striking. You have undefeated Ramirez Bajam taking on Bilal Williams. Bilal Always comes out and puts on a strong performance, but Ramirez was just absolutely sensational last time we saw him in the LFA cage. Not to mention Alonzo Men, if you'll talk about sensational undefeated pro- prospects, taking on, moving down to 205. We saw him a heavyweight a couple times on Access TV. Former professional boxer Bryce Renati Co. a technical, tough test. For Menafield, who is knocking on that UFC door. Undefeated identical 4-0 records meet in, a, in the flyweight division with Kevin Worth against Isaiah Gutierrez. I've seen Worth live a pair of times. A technical kickboxer who implements a lot of movement and then hits takedowns to throw his opponent off balance. 
also talking about undefeated prospects. Macy Barber, the future world champion, is her moniker. Back in the LFA cage, taking on Kyla Thompson. Barber, who trains with Dwayne Ludwig, has trained here with Brandon Gibson at the Jackson Wink Academy in Albuquerque, New Mexico. A LFA 33 card full of top-notch prospects. The same thing can be said for the Titan FC 48 card taking place on UFC Fight Pass from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Jose Shorty Torres defending the flyweight title in the main event against Alberto Arulo Torres, the 135-125 champion who has just been on a tour, collected so many belts in the amateurs, applies huge pressure, tight and technical with his boxing, and the knees up the middle, going to be taking on Latin American prospect Alberto Orella from Colombia, who has won his last two, a decision and a submission, both of the wins by decision. Going to be a hard one trying to get Torres down to the ground. Also, when we're talking about prospects, I mentioned this card. You have Michael Batista, the Olympic Cuban wrestler, undefeated at 4-0. He's taking on undefeated Russian pro prospect Adam Blugatraryov, UFC vet. Adriano Martins takes on fellow Brazilian Rafael Alves and Gustavo Bolart, undefeated 6-0 flyweight, meets Juan Peralta. A good mix of prospects also on this UFC Fight Pass card. Three great MMA events to choose from on Friday night and also on and if you're in the mood to just watch some striking, there's Glory 50 in Chicago. The main card, Glory 50 portion, headlined by the rematch between Herod Gregorian, who's challenging Myrtle Gruenhart for the welterweight title. The first time they met, Gruenhart landed a giant flying knee that knocked flesh from the brow of Gregorian. Fans ran into the ring illegally. It was a melee in Paris. They rematch. You also have a four-man heavyweight contender tournament. Benjamin Adebui, D'Angelo Marshall, and Guto Innocent versus Junior Tafa are the two first-round matchups. Now, in the Super Fight Series on UFC Fight Pass, you have Christian Baia challenging Sitachai Sichon Pilong as the devastating knees and kicks the Thai practitioner for the glory lightweight title. Not to mention a pair of welterweight bouts with Omar Moreno versus Casey Green and Daniel Morales versus Omari Boyd if you're just looking for some striking on Friday night. Not to mention the UFC on Sunday. Headlining bout, Donald Cowboy Cerrone versus Yancey Medeiros. Cerrone's back is against the wall. Medeiros likes to put him pressure. Cerrone has talked about going back down to 55, that this will be his last foray at 170. Definitely going to be a scrap with those two. In Texas, Derek Lewis looks to get back on track, taking on Marcin Tibera. The pressure against the kicking game is what we're going to see. How much cardio in the gas tank does Derek Lewis come with in this one? Because we know if he lands, he can't hurt you. In the lightweight division, James Vick continuing his assault, trying to get somebody in the top 15 to want to come out and play. He takes on Francisco Trinaldo. I think that the boxing and the pure pedigree is striking. A Vick is going to be too much for the Brazilian. Curtis Melender in a big spot, making his UFC debut, the LFA and Bellator vet, taking on former UFC title challenger Tiago Avas. These two are going to strike and hit each other hard. Guto Tibau, who if you go check my Caged Minds Combat Sports News Facebook page, you can see an interview with him, takes on Super Sage Northcutt. On the FS1 prelims, we have the interview going up soon with Joby Sanchez taking on Roberto Sanchez. Look for Joby to try to outstrike Roberto as Roberto looks for the takedowns. Flash Gordon welcomes Diego Rivera back to the Octagon after a USADA violation. Flash Gordon, I look for big things from that New Jersey fighter. His pressure, his ability to just keep going forward. And 
to feature fight on the early fight pass prelims. Steven Peterson versus Brandon Davis. Brandon Davis, the UFC matchmakers like him. His pressure style. Look for Ocho to come out hard. If you haven't seen the former Legacy Champion fight before, he is a grinder and a bite down on the mouth guard kind of guy coming right at you. For a UFC fight night in Austin, Texas, a lot of Texans on this card and I expect for them to come out and try to fight hard. You don't see a lot of that hometown, home field advantage in America as you did the last couple weeks in Australia and in Brazil, but I think this Texas event could kind of have that same element. Couple shout outs real quick. A shout out to Cameron Else on his 14 second TKO victory over in England. A shout out to Maurice the Hulk Jackson for his second round TKO of Melvin Gillard in the Sparta Combat League 65 main event. Now as far as looking at the local calendar, February 24th, we have the Jackson's MMA series. Jess Tafoya versus Roy Sacito in the main event. Same night in Hobbs School of Hard Knocks Promotions has a tough man contest going on. You want to get out there, you want to try to earn $1,000, you think you can be a fighter, look into it. Hit up the Cedro Casino and School of Hard Knocks Promotions on Facebook. March 17th at the Route 66 Casino, Legacy Boxing Promotions presents Route to Glory. March 31st, Las Cruces, New Mexico at the Las Cruces Convention Center, American Fight League presents Southwest Brawl 7. Wrecking Crew Promotions will be making their debut in Albuquerque, New Mexico in 2018 with a boxing event. Art of War in Clovis, that's Eric Swan's promotion. Their next MMA event will be April 28th. And that's our local calendar for what's going on here in New Mexico. A shout out to Edwin Ruiz and MAC10, that's MMACK10. Check them out on Facebook and thank you for all your support. Caged Minds MMA on Twitter and Instagram is how to keep up with me. I mentioned earlier Caged Minds Combat Sports News on Facebook. YouTube is Caged Minds MMA Show. CagedMinds.com for your results for all of uh, this weekend's upcoming action. Titan, Bellator, LFA, UFC, Glory. Thanks for listening.